Hello, students. If you're watching this video, you watched the first segment of molecular geometry and discussing the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory and how we can use Lewis structures, the Lewis dot structure, to determine the shape. And I just want to emphasize how important this is because the shape of the molecule is going to influence its properties. Just think form equals function. The shape influences its physical properties, which leads to chemical properties as well. So let's just go straight into it. I do want to remind everybody that, again, electron groups, when we're talking about electron group geometry, that is different than the molecular geometry. The electron group geometry looks at lone pairs. And in the other one, uh, I said, instead of thinking single, single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, or multiple bonds, just think your electron groups, okay? Remember your electron groups are just lone pairs or atoms, okay? That's how I want you to think of it, okay? And it's gonna be the same in this video, but in this video, we're actually gonna expand the octet. So now we're gonna learn the electron group geometry and the molecular geometry for compounds that expand the octet. So just as a review, the electron geometry when we dealt with octets, right? So two electron groups. So in this example, two electron groups are linear, uh, 180 degree angle, because we want them as far apart as possible. So we use this example of carbon dioxide. It doesn't matter that these are double bonds. We're just thinking that there's one, two electron groups attached to the central atom basically two atoms. And the way to get these as far apart from each other as possible is with 180 degrees angle and making a linear molecule. And then we went on, you know, to the electron geometry of trigonal planar. And if all of the electron groups were atoms, then the molecular geometry was also trigonal planar. We derived this angle by taking a circle and dividing uh, taking the 360 degrees in a circle, dividing by three to get the 120. And then if one of the groups is a lone pair, we had talked in previous videos how lone pair repulsion on the central atom is greater and there is a squeezing of this angle. So that angle is actually less than 120. Don't want you to memorize a bunch of angles. Just remember it's less than 120. And now because it has a lone pair, even though it has three electron groups and the electron geometry is the same, the molecular geometry has changed. So we saw that again with the tetrahedral, you know, four atoms, four electron groups, no lone pairs, both electron geometry, molecular geometry, tetrahedral, and then the bond angle is 109.5. But then we can get the deriv derivatives with lone pairs. And again, the lone pairs causes the angle to squeeze down more, so they're less than 109.5, and it also changes the molecular geometry's name because we are not taking into account that there's a lone pair there, and we're only looking at the molecule. So in the case of a 3-1, that's trigonal pyramidal. In a case of 2-2, two, two, we call that bent because it looks like a bent molecule. But that's pretty much what we did last time. This video is focusing on expanded octets. So I'm assuming that you've already watched the video on Lewis dot structures with expansion of the octets. You're gonna have to know how to do that. And you also did bonding patterns. So I'm primarily gonna look at where the electron groups are all atoms. So this video right now, I'll make other ones for the derivatives. I'm focusing on these two, okay? So if you notice, again, there are no lone pairs in either of these structures. And if I look, it makes sense when we talked about bonding patterns that phosphorus, which is in group five, can keep a formal charge of zero by having five bonds. Sulfur, which is in group six, can keep a formal charge of zero by having six bonds. Well, how can they expand the octet? Again, both phosphorus and sulfur are in the third energy level, which has a D sub level, which allows them to expand the octet. Now, typically this expansion of the octet is not gonna occur 
on, it's not going to occur on outer atoms. It's going to occur on the central atom, trying to maximize the number of groups attached. So again, we're going to focus right now on five electron groups and six electron groups that we saw earlier in bonding patterns for group 5A and 6A central atoms in the third energy level or beyond. So the five electron group is called trigonal bipyramidal. So that's why I always tell students, you can't just say trigonal because it could be trigonal planar. Some people even say trigonal pyramidal for the tetrahedral pyramidal. Um, but now you see it because it's trigonal bipyramidal. So trigonal bipyramidal has five things. And the reason why it's called bipyramidal, it's basically two pyramids stacked on each other's bases. So you can think of here is the base of one pyramid and it's a triangular base and it kind of peaks up right there. And then right below it is another pyramid that's stacked to it as well. So that's why it's trigonal, the base is a triangle, and it's bipyramidal because these triangular bases, there's two of them. Yeah, you like that? But the tricky thing is now we're getting that the positions are actually different. So we have what is referred to as an axial position and an equatorial. So I'm going to erase this to kind of emphasize the difference. So the equatorial, think of the equator. The equator in the earth, doesn't that go through the middle? So in the equatorial position, you have like a trigonal planar, right? You have, if I took, if I was looking down, if my eye was right here looking down on this, I would basically see, here is my central atom, and then I would see a chlorine here, here, here. And that bond angle, because I'm trying to separate in that equatorial position, these three electron groups, that bond angle is 120, just like trigonal planar. And that's what I see right there. And then in the axial position that's above this midline plane, they want to get as far apart from that plane, center plane as possible. So they go at a 90 degree angle this way, a 90 degree angle that way. And those are called axial position because you can think of this is like a north axis or the north pole and this is a south axis the south pole so the axial positions are above and below the center plane the center plane is the equatorial positions the bond angles in the equatorial position are 120 because there are three in that plane and we want to minimize repulsion so the best way to minimize repulsion in a plane of three things is 120 degrees and then the bond angle for the equatorial positions, because they're above and below the plane, is 90 degrees. And look, there is the phosphorus pentachloride that we talked about last time on our bonding patterns and also um, with expanding the octet. So what about the octahedral position? So there's only six things bound in an octahedral geometry. So why is it called octahedral? Where again, we have this center plane, but now if you look at the center plane, it's really, it's a square. And how am I going to split up if I was looking again, if I'm looking down from the top, how am I going to split that plane up? And my drawing's not perfect. I'm sorry, I'm not the best artist, but these are going to be right angles. So in that position, it's 90 degrees. So we could call this equatorial. They don't do that. Okay, we can just do it right now to make it easy. And then the axial would be 90 as well. Well, because everything's 90, this is completely symmetrical. So I could flip this, and now that would be in the axial position. So because all the angles are equivalent, and I can rotate this, and this has symmetry, there is no equatorial or axial position. All bond angles are 90 degrees. So why is it called octahedral? Well, you have what? one side, two side, here's a third, and then in the back, there's a fourth side. So I have a four-sided pyramid with a base that's a square, and then I have another four-sided pyramid stacked on that. So four sides, four sides makes eight. 
So this is considered an octahedral geometry. So it has eight sides and all the positions are equivalent. So we don't use the term equatorial axial. They're all 90 degrees. And here's the example of sulfur hexafluoride that we used before. So when you're doing your Lewis dot structures, you're still following the same rules, right? You got to count out the total number of valence electrons. So your phosphorus, you know, it has five. You're going to add to that the five chlorines, which are seven because they're in group seven. So that's 30, that's 40 valence electrons. And then you're going to pick the central atom. Well, the central atom is going to be phosphorus because it's uh, more electropositive. And then I'm going to attach all the other chlorines to it. So I might say, all right, here's a chlorine, you know, here's a chlorine, over here's a chlorine, here's a chlorine. Those are my outer atoms. And I'm gonna attach those. So one, two, three. I could even use a wedge to show that this is coming out of the plane if I wanted to. I could even use, if I want, and you don't have to, I'm not grading you on 3D, but you could do, you know, the dash or so that's going in the back of the plane of the board. But basically there are five chlorines, so there's five bonds. So I'm gonna subtract 10 electrons. Now, right off the bat, because there's five bonds, I know that my valency is 10 electrons around the central atom. This does not have an octet. It's gone beyond an octet. Is that okay? Yes, it's okay because Phosphorus is in the third energy level. So the remaining 30 electrons are just added to the five chlorine. So each one's going to get six three lone pairs to complete their octets. So that's six, 12, 18, 24, and finally 30. So if I go to my last set of rules, you know, the distribution, add the lone pairs, the outer atoms to satisfy octets, you're done. If no electrons remain, or if electrons remain attached in the central atom, no, after I add the lone pairs, there's no more. And I got to make sure the outer atoms have an octet. If no electrons are remaining and central atom has an octet, you're done. We have more than an octet, but it's okay because we've expanded it. So that would be an example of that trigonal bipyramidal. So you have to be able to draw a Lewis dot structure and then recognize it. What you do not want to do, what a lot of people start doing is they're like, oh, well, I'll just take this chlorine and add it here and add another bond. Don't do that. If you don't need to add more bonds, don't do that. In fact, that's going to mess up the formal charge of chlorine and phosphorus. Phosphorus doesn't want six bonds. It wants three bonds and a lone pair or five bonds. So don't add another bond. So just leave it. Leave the outer atoms happy with their octets the way they normally get it. And again, when the group 7A is an outer atom, it likes one bond and three lone pairs. So what about sulfur hexafluoride? Same thing, right? This is six plus six times seven. What is that, 42? 48 valence electrons. Sulfur is going to be the central atom. It's further away from fluorine. You know, I'm going to do this, that. So I've connected it. And I see I have to subtract all of the electrons. So from 48, I subtract 12. That's that hypervalency. I still have 36 valence electrons. Where are those 36 valence electrons going to go? They are going to go as lone pairs of the outer atoms to make them happy. How do we make fluorine happy? It wants one bond and three lone pairs, just like the bonding patterns for group 7A. So one, two, three, four, five, six, 12, 18, 24, 30, and last but not least, 36. If electrons remain, I would attach them to the central atom. No, there, none remain, so I'm good there. If it has an octet, you're happy. This has more than an octet, but again, it's okay because the central atom sulfur likes to have six bonds. Why does it like to have six bonds? Because it's in group 6A and it can have more than an octet. 
because it's in the third energy level that has a D sub level that allows for hypervalency. So I also would like to go to, if you don't mind, that FET simulation. And I love the FET simulation. Why? I'm going to turn on molecular and electron geometry, and I'm going to add five bonds. So right now there's two, three, four, five. And this is what I love about this. If I add the bond angles, it shows, and it's kind of hard, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of creepy, but it's showing the 90s right now. I got to try to show the 120s, but I, I think you can kind of see the 120s. You can play around with this, and it starts showing. Uh, I'm trying to get that 120, so it's so obvious for you guys. But this FET simulation lets you do it. There, I'm looking down. There. I'm looking down at those axial positions that I had talked about. And then I see in the equatorial positions, the 120 angle. And then in the axial positions from that center plane, I see the 90 degree angle for the axial positions. And I also see that the molecular geometry and the electron geometry are exactly the same because every electron group is an atom. There are no lone pairs. Well, what happens if I add one more? If I add one more, again, I could look down, but now I have that, instead of that triangular uh, equatorial position or base, I have a square. And if I cut that in half, every angle is 90. So really, if I move this over, this angle is 90. And that's why I say there really isn't an equatorial axial, because no matter how I rotate it, I'm always going to get that midline position to have 90 degrees. And it's always going to be an octahedral geometry for both. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. Uh, and thanks for tuning in. Again, use this FET simulation. It's awesome. And it really makes up for if you don't have a molecular model kit. Thanks so much.